Okay, let's try this again. Uh, this is our second part of um, the topic on polymer materials. Uh, we covered um, characteristics, vocabulary, chemistry of polymers in the first video. And, and this video is strictly going to focus on the molecular weight and how that's calculated or how that's expressed. And then behavior, and especially this unique behavior of polymers that's called viscoelasticity. So when we talk about the different things that can affect the properties of a polymer, we've already mentioned things like how much branching there is, how large the side group is, where it's located. All of those things do have an effect on properties, um, but more than those, uh, the molecular weight uh, of a polymer affects or determines the mechanical and thermal properties. Now, any polymer that you get will have within it molecules of varying sizes. Some very small molecules, some very large molecules, and then more, a and then a distribution with typically the average of all of those um, molecular sizes being somewhere in the middle. Uh, that is, uh, that's the molecular weight, and there's different ways of expressing that by taking averages of that distribution. A second quality or characteristic is something called polydispersity. And polydispersity is a measure of how broad the distribution is from the smallest particle, or sorry, the smallest molecule to the largest molecule. And that'll make much more sense when we make our calculations. So... Here's a graph that shows the effect of molecular weight. That's what we see here on the um, x-axis and different properties, tensile strength, uh, impact strength or toughness, and viscosity. So in all cases, as the molecular weight increases, the tensile strength increases, the toughness increases, and so does the viscosity. Um, for for the, these mechanical properties, the increase is pretty quick and then, and then the uh, property levels off so that as we get to higher and higher molecular weights, there's less and less change in toughness and strength. On the other hand, initially, as we increase the molecular weight, there's a slight change in viscosity, but that change becomes more and more dramatic with increasing molecular weight so that when we get to high molecular weight, uh, a, a, an increase has a very large effect on the viscosity. Now, um, mechanical properties, we kind of know what, why we measure those and why those are important. Viscosity is important for the purposes of molding or um, shaping a polymer <clears throat> into a part. If the viscosity gets too high, then it can be really difficult to form the, the polymer. So that, that will be a trade-off when you're thinking about the molecular weight uh, that you want to work with. So here's a, just a general normal distribution where I've got uh, x-axis is increasing molecular weight and the y-axis is the number of molecules that have that specific weight. And so we might, um, we might characterize this as sort of a set of bins, set of a set of sets. And each of these groups has a molecular weight that's in the average, and then a number of molecules that have that weight. And so on. This number of molecules that has that weight will have the symbol N sub I. And this would be, this first bin would be I equals one, the second is I equals two, and so on. And then each of these individual values would, would be the molecular weight average of that group. So to MW sub I. And so uh, we will get one characteristic molecular weight that's 
right in the center if this is a normal distribution. But we might not always have normal distributions. We could have a distribution with the same average, but it's much tighter. We could have a distribution with a skew to the lower molecular weights or a skew to the higher molecular weights. And so come up with um, a method for characterizing the average or really two different methods and the difference, the answer that we get from the two different um, calculations tells us another thing about the polymer distribution. So before I go into the um, mathematics of this, I want to try and draw an analogy um, that might hopefully um, help when, when we get to talking about making the calculations for molecular weight. I want, I want to think about, we have, let, imagine that we just have a bunch of apples, okay? And, and the apples have weights, let's say, five, six, seven, eight, nine um, ounces. So I'm going to collect those apples in, in bags. Am I not getting it in here? Oh, that's not a good color. We'll use this one. So this will be the uh, the bag that has five ounce um, apples, and then I'll have a bag that carries only six ounce apples, and a bag that has seven, and one that has. Eight, one that has nine, and one that has ten. Ten ounces, nine ounces, eight, seven, six, five ounces. So the, that's the that's the distribution, and I count up how many apples are each of those sizes, and let's say it turns out that there's two apples that are five ounces that go in that bag. And there's three apples that are six ounces that go in that bag. But when I go to seven ounces, there's nine apples. And when I look at eight ounces, there's 10. When I look at the nine ounce bag, there's five apples. And when I look at the 10 ounce bag, there's only one apple. Okay, so these are the values for N sub I, the number. So this would be n sub 1, n sub 2, n sub 3, n sub 4, n sub 5, and n sub 6, the number in each bag. So one way, if I just wanted the average weight, I could add up the weights of all the apples and divide by the number of apples. Okay, well, the number of apples is going to be the sum of n sub i, and I could just add that up, 2 and 3, and 9, and 10, and 5 and 1, that's 30. So it's a total of 30 apples. If I could find how much all they all weigh, then I could divide by 30 and I'd have the average weight. And one way to figure out how much they all weigh is to multiply the weight of each apple times how many are in each bag. So in a way, each of these numbers that are on the bags is a different, we'll call it a different molecular weight. Okay, so I have M, W sub I would be five, with I is one, M, W sub two would be six, and so on. So the weight of each group of apples would be N, W sub I times N sub I and that would be the weight of that particular group, W sub I. So for the, and for the first group, I've got two apples each weighs five ounces, so I've got a total of 10 ounces for that group. I've got a total of 18 ounces for the six ounce bag. I've got 63 ounces for the seven ounce bag, 80 ounces for the um, eight ounce bag, 45 ounces for the nine ounce bag, and 10 
ounces for the 10 ounce bag. So each of those is a W sub I. And so if we add them all up, W sub I, we get 10 and 18, 63, 80, 45, and 10. And I believe that that is 226 total ounces, total weight. And so we have something that we call the number average molecular weight, M sub N bar. And that's just going to be just like a numeric average. It's going to be the sum of all the M W sub I times N sub I divided by the sum of N sub I, which is the same as each number time molecular weight is this W sub I. So it's the same as the sum of the W sub I is divided by the sum of the N sub I. So that's 226 divided by 30. And that ends up being 7.5. right in the middle of my distribution. That's the number average. Now, that might not tell me everything I wanna know about this distribution. And if it doesn't, there's another way of calculating average that's a little biased toward the heavier, in, in the case of polymers, the heavier polymers, in the case of apples, the heavier apples. And it's called the weight average molecular weight. And the weight average molecular weight is equal to the sum of the molecular weight times the weight of that group over the sum of all the weights of the individual groups. So instead of for, um, for number average, I have the molecular weight times N. In this case, I'm gonna have the weight of that group, which in this case was 10 for those two, five times two, here's 10. There are this group, six times three. So these were the weights of each bag. That's what I'm gonna sum up here. The weight of each bag times the molecular weight. So I'm. It, 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 I'm sure you're like, wait, why are we doing this? Well, it's just another way of, cal of characterizing average molecular weight. Notice in both cases here, I've got molecular weight sub i times n sub i sum divided by sum of n, cancel. Here, I've got molecular weight sub i times w sub i over sum w sub i to cancel. So this would be 10 times 5, 50, and then I got 18 times six, and well, that's 60 plus 48, 108. And then I've got 63 times seven. And now we're getting to numbers uh, that I don't quite can't quite can't quite do off the top of my head. Um, 63 times 74, 20 plus 21, 441. And then this is 80 times eight, that one's easier, 640. 45 times nine, that's 360 plus 45, so that's 405. And then uh, 10 times 10 of 100. So the numerator here is 50 plus 108 plus 441 plus 640. 405 plus 100. All of that, sum of each of those times the sum of all the weight, which I already calculated is 226. And measured that way, the weight average molecular weight is equal to around 7.7. .7. 
So the weight average is always going to be a little bit bigger than the number average. And the how much difference there is between the two is a measure of how broad this distribution is. So if I had some 4 ounce and 3 ounce and some 11 and 12 ounce, uh, it would be a broader distribution and the difference between these two numbers would get bigger. Okay, so that's sort of a um, hopefully analog to what I want, analogy to what I want to do with polymers that will make these definitions a little clearer. So the number average molecular weight is equal to for every different group of polymers how many there are of a given molecular weight. And for each group, we're going to sum that. So the sum of how much each bag of apples or each group of polymers weighs divided by the total number of apples and the total number of polymers. And I'm noting here that for each group, the number of apples, say, times the weight of those apples is the total weight of that bag. So that's W sub I. So number average molecular weight could also be the sum of the weights of the, each bag divided by the total number of um, of apples. Okay. Um, then weight average. You see, we've got this sum of weight sub i m w sub i divided by the sum. W sub I. Again, they cancel, leaving me with just molecular weight. And I could, where there's W sub I, I could put this N sub I, W sub I, if that's easier for me. I tend to think it's easier to just leave that where it is. So let's practice this with, a, with an actual distribution. Oh, wow. That's no good. I'll have to do this again. Um, see, I think I have them written down. Give me one second. Okay, so I had, and this is, uh, this doesn't have all the rows that I would normally, that I would need, but just to show the, how we start this, I would have, there's four that have a molecular weight of 10, and then there was 10 with a molecular weight of 20, and then there was 18 with 30, and so on. So the, the sum of all of the um, different ends is the total number, and that ends up being... Two eighty-two. Um, we don't need to sum the in individual molecular weights, but each bag of apples or each group of polymers has a weight that's equal to the number of apples or the number of molecules times the weight of each. So this group weighs 40, this group weighs 200, this group weighs 540, and so on. And the sum of all of those would be like the sum of the weights of all the apples. In our case, it's the sum of the weights of all the molecules. And I got... 19,885 units. And then for this other kind of measurement of molecular weight where we take the weighted, the weights and average them again times the molecular weight of each. So essentially we're mu multiplying columns two and three. It gives me 400 here and four and three zeros, 4,000, um, 16,200, and so on. And I had a sum of all of that at 
$1,623,000, sorry, $1,623,750. And here are all the values tally up. So if I take the number average molecular weight, that's going to be equal to the sum of n sub i molecular weight sub i divided by the sum of n sub i. So it would be 19,885 divided by and this should be 282. And here's uh, my value. It's about 70.6. All right, and so where does that show up on the curve? Right in the middle. So there's 70. We're just a little beyond 70. So this is my number average molecular weight. If I go back to that chart or that table and I take um, the sum of W sub I, M W sub I divided by the sum of W sub I, that's the number the weight average molecular weight, M sub W bar is equal to the sum of um, W sub I M W sub I divided by the sum of W sub I. And so the sum of the last column, 1,623,750 divided by the sum of all the weights, which was 1,000, I'm sorry, 19,885. And it's going to show up behind there, but it's about 81.7. Okay, so on the distribution, there's my number average, and there's my weight average. The broader this distribution, the greater the distance is between those two values. Okay, so let's try with this distribution. This is skewed to low molecular weight materials. I want you to take a look at this and start to fill that in. And don't advance to that slide. That would be kind of like cheating. You could pause to do the calculations. This is a good way to check to make sure you understand how to do this. Okay, so I've got uh, about 11 that are 10 units long. I've got 18, maybe 19. I'm going to say that's 18 that are 20 units long. Um, and then this is... 48 that are 30 and it's long and 58 that are 40 and it's long. Oh, this needs to be switched. Wait, 
this should just be an eight. And then 58, letter 40 in this long. And then right at 60, or the 50 unit long chains. And then that really looks like it's exactly 55. that are 60 long and for 70 long let's say that's a uh, 47 for 80 long I'm gonna say that's not quite in the center so I'm gonna say it's 36 that are 80 and it's long For the 90 unit long, that looks like it's 25. For the 100 unit long, I'm going to call it 16. For the 110, I'm going to call that 11. For 120, I'm going to call that 6. 130, I'm going to say that's 3, and there's none at 140. So these numbers are the first two columns in this table. Example, well, here are our numbers, 73.3. And 60.1. I don't know why this is happening. I've got this bit of polymer and I'm applying my stress this way. Notice that that polymer isn't quite straight, but it could straighten under stress. That chain could straighten. It could be somewhat coiled and end up being uh, um, uncoiled and longer. And these kinds of deformation, where it, strength, where, it's, where it lengthens or stretches the angle, where it uncoils, if I remove the stress, I get those things back. That's what I mean by reversible. So bending the bond, uncoiling the, the, the chain, as soon as the, the stress is removed, it's, it's, it returns. And so the things that happen in the amorphous part of the polymer would, would uh, be a function of the elastic response. For plastic response to occur, chains have to, the secondary bonds between chains have to actually break. They slip past one another. And the crystallites themselves, the crystalline region starts to break up into smaller pieces. And eventually, if I continue to stress I will break covalent bonds, but that would take a lot of, of, of stress. So the shape of the stress strain curve for polymers looks like this. We're accustomed for metals to seeing stress increase to a point and then decrease and then failure. And at this point right here, is where that neck occurs in the polymer. Well, it turns out that the neck also occurs, I'm sorry, for the metal. It turns out the neck also occurs in the polymer, but instead of failure continuing at that location, at that neck, the neck itself grows. So um, let's see, what, 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 what we're looking at here is before the polymer was stressed at all. And we've got sort of an arrangement of morphous material and then sandwiched in between the morphous material or where the chains are lined up and, and we have crystalline material. So this is before I've applied any stress, point A. So as I start um, applying stress, I get the elastic response 
and that's where these chains uncoil. So you're, the, the, the crystalline part is staying the same, but the uh, amorphous regions in between are getting longer because of the chains are getting longer because they're uncoiling and stretching. So that's point B. And if I released the stress, I would go right back to zero and these chains would right go back to the, where they had been. So this is what it looks like when the neck forms. And what we're seeing here, notice that um, we've got the amorphous material starting to line up with the low direction, but the crystalline material hasn't yet. And now here it has. Everything's starting to line up with the stress and I've reached a maximum stress level. And this is where the point in time when that neck occurs. And so my uh, sample like that and I'm pulling on it and this is the neck which which would show up right there in the test okay now at this point the crystal lights are starting to break up and I'm getting not an increase in stress for an increase in strain. So there's more and more strain as these are breaking up and I have about the same level of stress. And what that looks like in my sample, if I had, if it had looked like this, so I've got this neck, what happens along here is the neck just gets longer. So I'm going to make that just a bit. There we go. So here was the neck here, and the neck just grows up and down from there. So now this is the neck, neck region. And the polymer has gotten longer. And so we see here, it's stretching, the strain is increasing because these are, these are breaking up, these crystal lights are breaking up as this neck just grows. No failure yet. The neck doesn't fail immediately like it does with, with a metal. Eventually, the neck takes up the whole reduced area. So... and there's none of the re reduced cross-section left. And so now I'm going to be breaking covalent bonds and separating the crystalline regions, and it ends up starting to look like individual fibers. Sometimes you can actually see them during that test. And when that's happening, it's gonna start increasing the amount of stress that's necessary, because now we're breaking primary bonds. 
and we're turning a solid into a group of bunch of fibers. And so the stress will go up again. Will it be higher or lower than this point? That's very much dependent on the polymer. I wouldn't say that it, you could, that there's a rule about that. What there is a rule about is that having dropped and stayed steady, the stress is now increasing to failure. And that's the viscal elasticity that has happening in a time dependent way because it takes time for these molecules to arrange themselves to stretch and then move past one another. All right. So that's, that's it for our polymer segment of this class. Um, if you work with polymers, you want to know more, I've got some great resources. Uh, that I can send you to some really good, um, relatively easy to follow polymer properties, polymer processing um, books that are put out by, well, a lot of them are put out by the Society of Manufacturing Engineers or the Society of Plastics Engineers. Okay, and then, of course, by that time you watch this, we've already had our uh, lecture on the BCC and FCC crystal structure and theoretical density. And so we'll pick up on that with metals on Monday. Thanks a bunch. Bye-bye.